Again. Apparently the people online couldn't hear me, so we're, uh, we're just adjusting our sound. Um, some of you may be familiar with Dr. Talker Scott's work on the Garden Professor's blog and Facebook page. And if you're not familiar with those two excellent resources, I highly recommend looking them up and, um, and maybe subscribing to the blog and or the Facebook page. If you have questions about the science behind gardening, these are two excellent resources to share. And so without further ado, I'm, it's my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Linda Chalker-Scott to the Ottawa Horticultural Society. Well, thank you, Rebecca. And I'm really pleased to be here. I wish I could be there in person with you. Um, but this is one of the best things about the pandemic I can think of is that this gives me an opportunity to reach people that I normally wouldn't be able to reach. So anyway, I know that um, Rebecca has a handout for you, and I'm not sure if that's electronic or if it was run off or whatever, but my main uh, point for mentioning it is that it has links to all of my websites and um, resources on the back. And so I want to make sure that you're able to, to download that and use that because that is good information for you. So um, the title of my talk, even though the, the front side says something different, is, is honing your, your, your BS detector, your bad science detector. And so I'm going to just talk about the processes by which um, gardeners can kind of go through information and figure out if it's good, bad, or otherwise. And a lot of this kind of gets into the nitty gritty about peer reviewed resources. And we'll talk about that at the end. I'm gonna start off with some pretty simple stuff. So, whoops, let's see here. It does not want to advance, there we go. Um, so first of all, I'll just briefly talk about how to evaluate information. And then we'll look at some specific examples of things including products and practices, and phenomena that are associated with um, gardening or maintaining landscapes, all the things that we love to do. Then we're gonna spend uh, a bit of time talking about what happens with peer review, which is supposedly the gold standard, but sometimes it doesn't work and we really need to understand why it doesn't work. And then of course, I will stick around until the last, um, the last dog is gone, I think is what my mom used to say, and um, answer your questions. So this is um, a manual that a colleague and I uh, put together a few years ago. It's a peer reviewed publication. It's um, a free download and is geared towards non-scientists. And it really is just a way of learning how to become scientifically literate in terms of being able to discern good from bad information. And as, as it says there, you can actually use these skills for any topic. It's not just gardening, um, but of course we're all interested in the gardening part. And it starts with what I was initially calling the credibility objectivity SIP because I'm an academic and that's the type of things that academics would say, but turns out that calling the crap test is a lot easier for people to remember. So what it, what it basically boils down to is taking information, which is gonna be that raw material there, putting it through a sieve, and maybe you end up with gold and maybe you end up with crap. And what crap stands for is credibility. So how credible your source of information is the relevance of that information to you as a gardener, as opposed to a farmer uh, managing a field, accuracy of the information, how current is it? It doesn't mean it has to be brand new. A lot of research has stood the test of time, but with our field of urban horticulture, the science is very quickly evolving. And so more likely than not information that you read that's 20, 30 years old was probably not very accurate anymore. And finally, the purpose. And so, for myself as a professor in urban horticulture and also an extension specialist, you know, my purpose is to disseminate education. Um, other people that are telling you things have other purposes. And I won't dwell on what those might be, but you just have to ask yourself, why are you getting this um, sales pitch, whatever the sales pitch might be. So that um, uh, publication I told you about will explain to you in a lot of detail on how to go through the different components of the crap analysis but since I don't want to take um, hours and hours and hours of your time, I'm going to just um, kind of jump right into it. So we're going to look at things that have no supporting science. And so that just means either there's been no research at all, and you'd be surprised how many things are out there floating around, that there's absolutely not one shred of research to support it. 
or it might mean that it's inconsistent research, meaning that sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And as an educator, I can't recommend anything that doesn't have a consistent um, track record to it. And the third area is there might be um, research out there that seems to be very supportive, but when you start analyzing it in terms of the crap analysis, you find out it's, it's very poor quality research or bad reporting, and it's not um, something that, that you should probably take uh, very seriously. The second group of things uh, fall under misapplied science. And so when I mentioned uh, relevance, um, you know, us as gardeners and, and people that like to putter in our landscapes are managing systems that are quite different than agricultural fields. But unfortunately, a lot of the products out there that were developed for agricultural use have been pushed into the gardening market. And we have to make sure that we're not using those because the, the goals of a farmer are much different than our goals as gardeners. And finally, there's the over extrapolated science. And this means um, things that work well um, in the lab and maybe even work well in a greenhouse or other very controlled situation, but they don't work well outdoors. And it also includes um, phenomena that we notice um, and unfortunately uh, assume that because we're seeing these two things that one is causing the other. And um, that, that's an interesting topic to, to discuss. So those are kind of the three major areas that we'll talk about tonight. So the first list is of a no, no consistent, reliable supporting science. And unfortunately, this is the longest list of all, which isn't very surprising because at least in the United States, there's absolutely no regulation of any garden products except for fertilizers, which are regulated for um, their mineral content and pesticides, which are regulated by the EPA. So things that are, that are marketed as pesticides or fertilizers are overseen by some agency. Everything else is fair, fair game. So it really is the wild west. People can do and, do and market whatever they want, however they want to market it. And it doesn't even matter if it's just complete lies. Um, there, there's no recourse um, if you are unfortunate enough to buy into the, the stories. So the products that um, fall into this are things like balanced fertilizers. So like 10, 10, 10 or 15, 15, 15. Um, compost tea, conditioners, these are soil conditioners. Kelp products, uh, the superiority of organic products over conventional products. Vitamin B1 as a transplant fertilizer and wound dressings. And so obviously I'm not gonna be talking about all these things. I'm just going to be um, doing um, you know, example for, for each um, general topic, but we have time for questions. And so if it's any of these things that you really wanna jump in on um, at that time, we can do that. In terms of practices, um, it includes things like not watering uh, plants when it's hot, um, biodynamics, companion planting, fertilizer injection, cubicle culture, lasagna mulching, uh, leaving root balls of woody plants intact when planting them, uh, the superiority of native plants and permaculture. So a lot of these things, at least in the United States, um, I've seen, unfortunately, master gardeners have kind of fallen under the spell of, of a lot of these practices because they've got very compelling um, names that just make you kind of feel good. And it just seems like it would be good stuff. And unfortunately, it's not. And master gardeners, um, have a contract more or less with their university that they will only use science-based information. So it's very distressing to me when the master gardeners start um, re repeating a lot of the myths about these practices and products. So I'm gonna talk about native plants because this is a real hot button issue. And it's important to understand what science and what's not when we're talking about um, native plants. So there's um, a very persistent um, feeling, at least in my part of the country, that native plants are superior to introduced species. And there's lots of reasons that are trotted out for this, but what I want to show you um, <laughs> visually is evidence why this isn't necessarily true. So I don't know if you all have um, Galtheria Shalom in, um, in your part of the North American continent. I don't think it occurs over there, but anyway, this is called Salal. It's a really nice plant, um, very, very easy to grow. Um, under the right conditions. It's got glossy green, evergreen leaves. It's got these really pretty little bell-shaped flowers and then it has um, edible fruit. It's kind of mealy. I don't particularly care for it myself, but, but wildlife loves it. So it's a great wildlife plant. It's a very aesthetically attractive plant. 
And this is what it looks like in its natural environment, which is underneath a canopy of generally evergreens. Unfortunately, we've kind of taken all those attributes and assumed that when we stick them out in the middle of a parking strip that they will look just the same. And of course they don't. Um, they're not adapted to urban conditions, especially high light, uh, dry conditions, air pollution and all that kind of stuff. And so what happens is that they don't, they don't thrive and then they become susceptible to opportunistic pests and diseases. So unfortunately they just get used a lot because they're natives, they're easy to find and ideally they're very attractive plants. The question you have to understand is that there aren't, there aren't anything, uh, well, it's not a question so much, but uh, there aren't plants that are native to urban areas. Um, urban areas are obviously developed, they're not natural, they have very artificial conditions in many ways. And so we can't assume that whatever used to be there is similar to them in any way, shape, or form. And in fact, what you find is you have increased levels of air pollution, that increased drought conditions, uh, heat islands, um, increased light, especially in areas that used to be under a forest canopy, um, salt from de-icing salts or from construction or from fertilizers. Um, the soils are nothing like what used to be there. And the pests and disease um, have a field day because they've got, there's lots of um, landscape plants that suffer. And so those become targets for opportunistic pests and disease. Um, so what we have to look at is, is the evidence about native and non-native plants and uh, well, trees and shrubs. So woody plants are what I'm really focusing on because it's the backbone of a landscape. And what I did is I went into the literature and um, gleaned about 140 different articles that compared landscapes that had only native plants to landscapes that had a mixture of native and non-native plants to see which ones supported wildlife better. Because that seems to be the impetus for a lot of this native plant um, perception is that we can only support our wildlife if we if we have uh, native plants. And so what is what is true is that if you have properly selected non-native trees and shrubs along with you know appropriate native plants, whoops, didn't do that, um, that they will tolerate your urban conditions. So they're not going to look like that forest allow. They support wildlife and they enhance the biodiversity of urban landscapes. So there are many, many things that are not noxious weeds. They're not invasive. They cause no problems. And they've been on this continent for, for decades, if not centuries, and they haven't caused any problems. So there's really no reason not to consider them to be part of, of your garden or landscape because they do provide all of these benefits. So there's nothing about the nativity of plants that is particularly important in terms of supporting native wildlife with the exception of those specialist insects and other and, and some plants um, that do require a particular host, but that is a, a, a very small minority of all the wildlife that's out there. So um, I wanna show you a picture of um, a bumblebee. And so this is one of our native bumblebees. It's the white bottom bumblebee and for many years, um, entomologists had thought that this was uh, an extinct species, at least in our state, because nobody was finding any. And then um, a photographer, an amateur photographer, about 15 years ago took this picture up in the northern part of, of Washington state. And the entomologists were delighted to see that the white bottom bumblebee was actually still around. And this um, plant that it's on is uh, Himalayan blackberry, which is one of our listed noxious weeds. And I'm not advising or recommending that anyone plant this as a resource. My point is, is that insects and other wildlife learn how to use other resources. This is kind of a basic tenet of ecology, that if you bring in a new resource that doesn't have any herbivores or anything else that's using it, um, populations of insects or birds or whatever will learn to use it, and then it becomes part of the food web. So yes, it's an annoying plant, um, no, I would never plant it, but the fact is that it provides a abundant amount of nectar and uh, pollen and fruit for a lot of the wildlife that don't have our native plants anymore, especially in urban areas. So we have to keep that in mind is that uh, we may not like these things because they're not native and they're not, they don't have any particularly nice attributes, but that doesn't mean that wildlife won't use them. So looking at this literature that, that I um, analyzed, to have the greatest biodiversity of landscape, of, of wildlife, sorry, in your landscape, there is, there, is some, there is a few key points. The first was, is you have to have diverse vegetation. So that means having ground covers 
and bulbs and annuals and herbaceous perennials and shrubs of all sizes and trees of all sizes. And it's that diversity that allows you to support more wildlife. The second part is the vertical structure. And the, the more vertical structure there is and the layering effect, um, the more niches there are for wildlife to find habitat, to nest, and, and, and to be safe from predators. So the nice thing about these two facts is that the things that are attractive to wildlife to us are really aesthetically attractive too. We love having a diversity of plants. We love having structure and you know three-dimensional structure to our gardens, and that also benefits the wildlife. And then having the food nesting sites, you know, whatever those are for your desired wildlife is important. And I think a lot of us are pretty good about figuring out how to bring in and maintain um, pollinators, whether they're birds or insects. Um, so, and a lot of plants will provide that without us having to go to the trouble. So if you're interested in this topic more, I published um, two papers on it. Um, one was the, the literature review, which was in Arboriculture and Urban Forestry um, in 2015. And that was looking at all of these papers and it's, you know, it's a scientific uh, journal article. Um, it's not difficult to, to read, but you may not want to slog through it. And what I did as well is publish um, a peer reviewed fact sheet, which is uh, kind of a, I want to, I don't want to say a reader, well, it is kind of a reader's digest condensed version of the, the journal article that also has a list of action items for gardeners on what they should do if they want to bring more wildlife into the landscapes. So this is kind of my, my job anyway, as I do a lot of research and I publish in the scientific literature. And then I try to adapt much of that scientific literature um, for gardeners and other people who, who love to have plants. Okay, so that brings us to our second category, which is misapplied science. And so this includes products such as antitransparents, Epsom salts, gypsum, hydrogels, and phosphate fertilizer, especially for transplants. And then practices include things like amending the soil before planting uh, trees and shrubs and foliar fertilizers. So what I'm gonna talk about, because it tends to be a, a complicated problem and, and one that I still am disappointed to see that, that many uh, landscape companies still follow is amending the soil before planting. So what the myth is here is that before you want to, you know, plant trees and shrubs, you wanna work lots of organic matter into the soil to improve it which seems to make sense, but this is one of those things where it's really based on planting a crop and is not based on any kind of science that's relevant to using trees and shrubs or anything that happens to have more than an annual lifespan. And this picture kind of encapsulates the, the problem, which is if you take a rototiller to your yard every year to work lots of organic matter in, then the things you've already planted, like those poor camellias right there, will have absolutely no roots left by the time you're finished. So we can't have this practice um, as a way of improving soil if we're talking about landscapes. So we need to get away from that and we need to have a different model, which would be like a forest uh, model as opposed to an agricultural field. So when you do this, um, there are some long-term effects. The first one's pretty easy to see and that's that you'll have standing water a lot. And so we, we're just gonna call that hydrology disruption. I'll explain how, how that one works. The second thing that happens is that soil will subside, and that's because um, if it's a heavily organic amendment, all that amendment will eventually decompose and it's not being replaced by anything. And so the whole soil system just kind of sinks down to a, a lower level. And then we can have problems with nutrient toxicities because there is such a thing as too much of a good thing and adding way too much compost means you're going to have excess amounts of certain nutrients that will cause problems. So in terms of the hydrology disruption, this, this cutaway does a really nice job of explaining it visually. And this was um, a set of experiments that was done by um, a soil scientist at Washington State University back in the 1950s, I believe. Anyway, so he created this uh, setup, which is two pieces of glass that are very closely, um, you know, to, uh, it's like an aquarium, except it's almost two dimensional. So it's not very, it's not very uh, deep, but well, not very, from side to side, it's not very deep, but it's, it's very deep from top to bottom. Um, and, and then he has two different types of soil in there. So the bottom is a sand layer, the top is a silt layer. So you've got this finely textured soil on top of a very coarse soil. And then what's happened is that he's put an Erlenmeyer flask on top of that, which is dripping water into the soil system. And you can see with that top picture that what's happening is the water is moving down more or less uniformly, both horizontally 
and vertically. And that's because it's a uniformly textured soil and, and water moves through a uniform system uniformly. The problem occurs is when you get to that interface between the two soils. So our heads will say that, yeah, if you have a coarser soil at the bottom, then of course water is going to move through it faster. But in fact, it doesn't move through it at all. It stops moving. And it's because soil texture differences will stop water from moving until you have a super saturated system. And it's just a function of how water works in terms of how it binds to itself and how it binds to substrate. So it, it completely um, negates the perception that we need to have things in the bottom of pots and everything else for drainage. And it also suggests that we certainly shouldn't be amending soils before we're planting because we're going to interfere with water movement through that soil. So we've got this um, system now where the water has stopped at the interface. It's now still moving horizontally, but it's not moving vertically <clears throat> until you get so much water that the gravitational pressure finally pushes through and starts to, to seep out the bottom. But in the meantime, what you've done is you've created a perched water table. And so you have a perpetually wet soil. And as I said, you can see this easily happening with many landscapes, especially where there's been turf installed or something like that, where they've gone in and put in compost and sand and everything else to create this turf bed. And that just completely ruins the ability of um, the soil to move water through it in a uniform way. Okay, then there's subsidence, and this one's pretty easy to see. Also, um, this is this is my favorite example, um, which is a very small, isolated landscape that has a single Japanese maple in the middle of it, and you can see this kind of sitting up there, perched above everything else. And it's because, as I said, as organic matter breaks down, if it's not replaced, um, then all the inorganic matter just settles and and forms a compacted layer of inorganic material. So you can see where the soil used to be, which is where that brown line is. And then you can see where it is right now. So over time, you know, several inches of that soil has um, the organic part of it's decomposed. It hasn't been replaced. And so the whole um, soil system has settled several inches below grade. The third problem is with over amended soils. And I can't overemphasize the importance of having a soil test done at least once, so you have baseline values for what your soil has and what it doesn't need more of. So if you have a soil test that looks like this, where you have everything that's off scale, you know, above optimum uh, might sound like it's good, it might sound like A plus, it's not. It should say toxic because it gets to the point where this is going to interfere with the plant's ability to survive and it's toxic. So if you have um, a soil test that says your macronutrients are above optimum, and you go over and you look and see that, yes, we've got phosphorus in this case, it's at 45 parts per million. Optimum range is 14, four to 14 parts per million. And it even tells you phosphorus is excessive, then you will definitely have some problems with your plants. Um, without going into a lot of detail on this, um, phosphorus interferes with the plant's ability to take up iron and manganese. And so you'll get all kinds of deficiencies in the foliage, which looks like you're, you know, like you're missing something in the soil, but in fact, you're actually missing um, things that are, uh, in, well, it's in the leaf and the problem is the plant can't take up the nutrients it needs when there's too much of something else there. So there's lots and lots of research on nutrient deficiencies, very little research on nutrient toxicities, but it's kind of one of those newer fields, especially in soil science where they're trying to, trying to figure out how toxic levels of certain nutrients interfere with uptake of other necessary nutrients. So, um, if you're interested in hearing more about soil in terms of how you manage it um, and, term, and having you know, a good structure and, and, and um, functionality for supporting plants, this is an um, article that my colleague from California and I wrote a few years ago, and it's in the Journal of, of NACA, which is the um, extension organization in the United States. And it's free download, it's peer reviewed, and it is targeted directly towards people that are interested in gardens and landscapes. Okay, that takes us to over-extrapolated science. So this will include the products such as corn gluten meal and harpen and probiotics, which include both bacteria and fungal types of uh, inoculants. And then there's phenomena that we think are actually important in the landscape, which aren't, and this includes allelopathy and humus formation. 
And as I said, I'm not going to be able to talk about all these things, but if you want to hear more about some of them, at least a short bit about them, we can, we can do that at the end. But we're going to talk about microbial inoculants because they still seem to be a big deal. And so what you're told is that if you buy things like the, micro, the mycorrhizal inoculants, that it will improve soil health and enhance root growth and improve plant establishment. And it's absolutely true that beneficial microbes will do all these things for plants. It's, it's not even an argument. The question is, are things that are in a bottle or box going to work? And that's what the research um, did with these particular products is, is test them to see if they actually had an effect. So the beneficial microbes do things like um, fix nitrogen. So those of you that, are, that grow legumes of any sort are familiar with nitrogen fixing bacteria. And uh, there's also a function that, that some uh, bacteria have in terms of kind of creating a sheath over the outside of fine roots. Um, and that protects those roots from being attacked by pathogens. And then there's the mycorrhizal fungi, which have um, some, some great uh, activity in terms of assisting plants in nutrient and water uptake. So there's no argument these happen. And we know that there's lots of good um, um, uh, science on this, that the, this is a picture of um, mycorrhizal fungi spores that are germinating. So what they do is they're kind of creating um, a network of root hairs that are actually fungal hyphae that will increase the plant's ability to reach parts of the soil that it can't get its roots into. And so when they do that, they increase the uptake of water and nutrients. That's all provided back to the plant. Um, if there's beneficial microbes on the outside of the root, there's no physical space for pathogens. And finally, some of these guys can actually destroy pathogens. So, you know, our whole perception that microbes are kind of these inert little specks that don't do much is actually not true. And some of them actually have a behavior uh, where they can kind of seek out and destroy pathogens, um, not because they're trying to help the plant, but because, um, you know, they want the space for themselves. The packaged microbes is the question. So the first thing that happened with some of this um, research was uh, a microbiologist bought some of these inoculants, and this is decades ago now, and took them back to his lab and plated them out. So this is something we can't do, but if you plate out microbes on petri dishes that have auger on them, you can get them to grow out and you can find out what kind of microbes they are. And what he discovered was is that most of the samples that he tested grew nothing because everything was dead. So you have to realize that these inoculants um, are spores and spores are very much like seeds in that they have a limited lifespan. And we as gardeners know that you don't wanna be using um, especially small seeded plants that have seeds that are you know, two, three, four, five years old because most of them aren't gonna germinate. So the same thing happens with these packaged products is you don't know if the spores are actually viable or not. Um, the marketers have gotten smarter with this because they read, they read the research too. And so even if you have completely useless spores, what they do contain now in these packages is nitrogen fertilizer. So people now will use this and they'll get, you know, a, a boost in growth. And then they'll swear it's because of this very expensive nitrogen fertilizer that they've purchased rather than, um, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not the microbes they're doing, it's just nitrogen fertilizer. And that's, this is an expensive way to do it. The only um, purpose that's been shown to work, and it's not, doesn't work all the time, is if you're trying to um, inoculate sterilized media. So if you happen to be involved in producing things in a greenhouse where you're using sterilized potting media, you know, using these inoculants might help jumpstart the um, microbial life in, the, in that media. There's no guarantee, but that is at least an area where there might be some effect. However, when you're looking at landscape, it doesn't work. So many of these studies did look at landscape plants and one in particular that I thought was well done, uh, looked at things for a year. So they inoculated half the plants and uh, these are woody plants and planted those and the other half they did not inoculate. And then a year later, they dug everything up to, to look to see what was on the roots. And they discovered that all of the plants were inoculated, not just the ones that have been inoculated beforehand, but everything that was in there had, had these mycorrhizae associated with them and they were all the same. And none of them were, 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 had any trace of the packaged product left. So what this says is that you've already got these active uh, microbial species in the soil, you know, because you've already got trees and shrubs there. And if it's a healthy soil, they're going to have lots and lots of beneficial microbes there already. So there's really no point 
and adding more to it because they're already there. So this is one of those things that if you just feel like you really have to do something, you know, take a handful of soil from underneath some well-established trees and shrubs and sprinkle that around and that'll be loaded with spores of beneficial microbes. If you have unhealthy soils, and there's a lot of marketing on this, that you can improve your soils by adding mycorrhizal products, it actually won't work. And that's because unhealthy soils are generally poorly drained, have very little oxygen, and the beneficial microbes require oxygen and they will not do well in a poorly drained anaerobic soil. So no point in trying to treat soil problems that way because it certainly won't work. Um, I have a publication on this too, at least in terms of mycorrhizae. And it does have a section on, um, you know, how you can protect the mycorrhizae and a section on uh, why, the, why the inoculants uh, won't work. Okay, so that leads us to good and not so good science. Um, and as I said, there's many more myths I could have talked about. And the nice thing is, is that if you have the handout that um, Rebecca's uh, provided to you, it does have all kinds of free resources in terms of learning about some of these other uh, products and practices. But I, what I really wanna spend time with is, is talking to you about how to judge what's good and what's not so good science. So, with the gold standard being peer reviewed uh, literature, and I'm not gonna talk about you know, good literature because I don't need to, what I need to do is talk about some anomalies. And unfortunately, they're not that rare, they're, they're fairly common. So the first is that you might have a paper that has really well done research, but it has poor reporting. And what I mean by that is when the article is written up, somewhere bias seeps in, and the most likely place for bias to seep in is in the abstract. And there's a couple of reasons for that. Um, one of the reasons is because the, the abstract is a summary, and a lot of times if you're, if you're biased, and we, we're all biased, and sometimes you just don't know you're doing it, but you tend to be selective in what you put in your summary. So you selectively highlight the results that you're really excited about, and you kind of downplay the things that you're not so excited about. And this becomes a problem for people that are trying to use science-based information because they'll see the abstract and they'll read it and they think, wow, look at this. And they don't read the entire paper. And sometimes because the paper's behind a paywall and that's a real problem. And so you're left with this perception that, you know, that here, here's a peer reviewed paper that says X, Y, and Z, but you don't have a chance to see if that's really true. So I'm gonna use this as an example, um, another native plant uh, topic which has to do with, well, it's part of the native plant uh, superiority topic. So as I mentioned, um, you know, there's a perception that you can only use native trees to provide resources for native insects. And so this paper came out in 2009. And I imagine several of you might know who Doug Tallamy is. He's a very well-known entomologist and he's a good entomologist, but he's not a plant scientist. So I, I, this, is, this is the type of thing you're gonna to need to think about. So when you're thinking about credibility, um, you know, credibility in terms of knowing entomology, fantastic. Credibility in terms of knowing much about plants, not so fantastic. And when you have a research team that has no plant scientists on it, and you plant it, and you publish it in a journal that is not a plant journal, um, then there's a possibility that you're going to have some problems with the quality of that research. So this was, um, you know, one of these topics uh, or papers that, that I came up with when I was doing the um, the review. And so I got into all of these papers very carefully. And this one stood out because it was not a well done paper. So in the methods, but what you're told is that we labeled all the genera, so these are all the genuses that were that contained native species that were in the geographic distribution of where they were doing the study, which is in the mid-Atlantic mid region. So there was 103 genera and they combined all the species in a genus together you know, as, as a genera, even if the genus contained one or more species that had been imported for use from Europe or Asia. So you have to think about this. If you're trying to, trying to compare the effect of native plants to non-native plants in terms of supporting wildlife, you can't very well take them and combine them all into one pot. It literally is mixing apples and oranges. You have to keep them separate to compare them, but they didn't do that. They just shoved them all into a genera and called it a native genera, even if it had members in there, you know, species in there that were not native plants. Problem number one. So in this 
and I, as I said, I dissected this paper pretty thoroughly. There was almost 200 introduced woody species, either trees and shrubs and vines, that were folded into quote native genera. And that analysis was also extrapolated to all herbivores. They were working with lepidopterans, and you all know that those are moths and butterflies. They then said that their results would be true of any insect group, which really surprised me because I could think of several reasons why lepidopterans would not serve as a reasonable surrogate for other um, for full fulivorous insect herbivores. So those are leaf eating insects. And I can think of all kinds of leaf eating insects that are huge, major pests. They eat everything. They don't care if it's native or otherwise, they eat everything. So no, lepidopter are not a good surrogate for all other insects, but that's what they did. So I want you to look at this, this result list. So this, this list is what they call the 20 most valuable plant genera ranked from most to least in terms of their ability to support lapidopteran species in the area that they were doing their work. And in this are, is the genus Prunus, the genus Rubus, and the genus Rosa. And there's several others of these two that I could have picked, but this, you know, these three genera contain highly invasive plants that got folded into this native genera. And this is why you just can't do this kind of, of, of comparison because you're, you're really not comparing anything. Um, you, you, you've already contaminated your data set by saying that everything in this genus were considered to be native even though they're not. So you remember the picture of the black bottom bumblebee, uh, I'm sorry, the white bottom, bottom bumblebee. That's, you know, the blackberries, Himalayan blackberry. It's a a rubus species, highly invasive, and yeah, it produce, it provides a lot of, of um, habitat and resources for native insects, but it's invasive, it's not, and it's not native. So the problem is, and I had assumed that they had done this because they, they wanted to, to stack <laughs> um, the data in such a way that they had really good results from, from these genera, um, and didn't want to have to explain why things like various invasive rubus species, which always have very tasty berries, um, did so well. Um, and, but then I talked to uh, a previous graduate student who told me that the reason they didn't separate them out differently is they couldn't tell the differences among the different species of their plants because they didn't have any plant scientists in their team. So rather than, rather than take the time to find out exactly what these plants were, they just called them all, you know, uh, rubus or pinus or whatever, because they couldn't get them all separated as to what species they were. So it, it just was not a well done paper. Um, it was, it was, it was fairly flawed. In my opinion, it should never have been published because it did not do a good job of data analysis because it combined natives and non-natives together and then con considered them all to be natives um, at, the, at the genus level. So you, you just can't find anything valuable from that work. But the unfortunate thing is, is that paper is used to tout the benefits of, of native plants for butterflies and, and moths. And it's based on very, very badly done science. So what you have to think about when you're reading things that kind of make you wonder, well, wait a second, I've read lots of other things that say the opposite, that if you have a paper that's at odds with the majority of other papers, it has to meet a really high bar. And this isn't to say that science doesn't change because it does. I mentioned before that urban horticulture is changing all the time but it has to be well done science. It has to meet that standard and it has to be repeatable. Somebody else must be able to do it. So when you find these, these odd little papers out there where nobody else is able to show the same result, um, that, that paper hasn't changed the direction of science. You know, it's, it's just for some reason um, an outlier and sometimes it's because it's been poorly done. So it's not to say that Doug Tallamy hasn't done good work. He's done lots of good work, but this was not an example of, of a good paper. It gets worse, um, there's the not so good science, and this is the poor quality research. So this is stuff that's done with authors who really have no business um, researching whatever they're, they're writing about at all because they're not experts in the field. So just because I have a PhD in horticulture, you won't find me out um, writing about nuclear medicine or um, art history because that's not my forte. And having a PhD doesn't, doesn't make me an expert in everything in the world. It makes me an expert on one topic. Unfortunately, other authors don't seem to feel the same way and, and assume that because they have a PhD, they can write about anything they want, and they do. So 
these authors often will correlate or take correlations and conflate them to causation. So in other words, they're, they're saying that these two things are um, unrelated. Uh, one is causing the other without any evidence to, to support that. And they're always published in marginal journals. Well, not always, usually marginal journals. Um, but often the times they don't even have peer review and many of them are open access. Now, open access is a good thing. I applaud the fact that uh, it, there, things are online now, but that also means that a lot of bad actors have gotten in there with really, really junk journals and um, predatory journals and things that are, are more harm, cause more harm than, than good. And this is one of the topics that just, again, another hot button topic. And this is um, the, the, the belief that glyphosate, which is the active ingredient Roundup, causes human disease. And one of the first papers that was published on this was in 2013. And you can see the title there. I'm not gonna waste my time reading it out loud <laughs> because though it's a good example of a paper when you read it, the whole thing is like that title. When you're reading it and, you're, and you feel like your head is full of cotton and you don't understand it. And you have to understand that I do read things like this. And I, I, one of my minors was in biochemistry. So I'm really into biochemistry anyway. And I, I read this paper and I could not make heads or tails of it. It just made me feel dizzy trying to, to sort it out. But unfortunately, because of the way this thing has been presented um, and, and popularized, is that it's just, it's grown legs. And it's been one of the worst things happened in terms of taking a pretty effective and pretty targeted herbicide and saying that it causes obesity and Alzheimer's, and autism, and anorexia, dementia, inflammatory bowel disease, depression, Parkinson's, reproductive issues, liver disease, and cancer. Everything you can think of that's bad is caused by glyphosate. And it would be easy to laugh this off or ignore it, but all of you know that there's been now lawsuits that have been won by people saying that they have gotten whatever cancer it was they have because they used to work with Roundup. And the problem is, is that this is just not good science. It's not even realistic science, but lawsuits are not um, based on scientific evidence. They're based on whoever has the best lawyer. And that's unfortunate because it now means that, that many, um, you know, things like glyphosate, which again is a pretty targeted chemical um, and doesn't affect much outside the plant kingdom, is not going to be available, you know, for gardeners to use, and we're going to have to rely on things that are much more broad spectrum. So the reason I say that is because glyphosate, the active ingredient, actually interferes with an enzyme that's in plants, and it happens to be the enzyme that helps plants uh, make tannins and lots of other types of uh, what we call secondary chemicals. It's not it's not an enzyme that, that humans or animals have. So there is no real way that it could cause all these problems because it doesn't have a role in interfering with any biochemical pathway that exists in humans, but that doesn't matter. So let's look at this article to see what they've done. So um, here's the crap analysis, um, looking first of all at credibility of, of the author. The author is um, at MIT, which is certainly not a bad thing. Um, problem is that she has a PhD in computer science which has absolutely no relevance to anything in this article because the article is full of things having to do with life sciences. We've got epidemiology, we've got med medical um, science, we've got plant science, we've got you know, biochemistry, all these things you have to have um, an understanding of to really be lucid and, and to be an expert, but she's not. It was published in the Journal of Entropy, which is uh, one of my favorite names for a journal which is a pay for play predatory journal. If you pay them, they will publish it. There's no peer review. It's just one of those things you pay it and they'll, they'll print it. Um, as you go through it and you try to wait, <laughs> read it, this was one of the things that jumped out at me was that they said that glyphosate is a textbook example of exogenous semiotic entropy, the disruption of homeostasis by environmental toxins. Like I said, this is just, it's a word salad. It's so hard to get through, but that's a deliberate choice because it makes you feel dumb. And then you take for, you know, you just assume that the author knows more than you do. Um, but anyway, I, you know, I know this literature pretty well, but I'd never heard of exogenous semiotic entropy before. So way back in 2013, I Googled it, you know, with the quotation marks around it. So it's a phrase that you're searching for. 
And the, the phrase exogenous semiotic entropy came up exactly once, and that was in this article. So they made it up, and then they said it was a textbook example of what they'd made up. And it's just, you know, it's building lie upon lie upon lie. And it's just, it's, it's just such the antithesis of what we're supposed to do as scientists and educators. And I, I can't, I can't, I don't know the motives. Um, but the, the way that this is um, couched in terms of how she figures this out, because of course, there are certain groups this plays well with, and one of them that asked her in an interview, you know, how did you figure this out when all this work for decades by hundreds of other scientists can't figure this out? And she said, so basically what I do is I read papers and I process them with the computer to help me understand them and interpret them and generalize and build a story. So all she's looking is for is correlations and then she's conflating them to causations. And then she just causes all this fear and panic among anyone who has any interest in, you know, in gardening. Um, by, by saying that, that, that glyphosate is going to cause all these problems. So that's when the BS meter goes off, is when you re we read all this stuff and it's just one problem on top of another. And this is one of the worst papers I think I've ever read and probably the worst paper that's ever gotten the amount of readership um, that it certainly didn't deserve. So we have to understand that you can't, just because two things are correlated does not mean um, one is causing the other. So this is one to chart from one of her other articles. It says that glyphosate causes autism. So you know she's she's got this graph on one on one side is looking at the increase in autism, and it's comparing that to how much glyphosate is used. And she's saying, oh, because they're correlated, one's causing the other. And there's absolutely no evidence for this, but it's just too easy for people to jump on that um, and just say, well, yeah, you know she's got to be right. There's no other reason for this. And we know that there's all kinds of other things could be going on. It's very easy to look at correlations among all kinds of different things that are not related. So we have to avoid jumping to the conclusion that one thing is causing the other without some kind of hard evidence to show that. So anyway, how can you find good information? <laughs> well, you know, you know what kind of bad information to avoid now. Um, and all these links again are on the handout. Um, and this was the first thing I put together, which is my page of horticultural myths. And there's about 70 different myths on there. And so these are white papers. And what a white paper is, is just, um, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a scientifically researched paper, but it doesn't have, it's not gone through peer review. And I don't have references in there because when I first did these, it was for the benefit of the nursery industry and I was doing it for their magazine. Um, so it was just, you know, my take on a, a whole bunch of different myths. And then after, a few years, I just put them all up on the web because I figured out figured they might as well be might as well be available to everybody. So those are available for free downloads. I mentioned again the the scientific literacy manual that I hope you will download and and enjoy. Um, it's not written for a scientific audience. Um, it really is written. It's actually written at a tenth grade level. So anybody who's um, out there gardening is probably going to be able to to, to make their way through it okay. Um, I've published a number of books, um, which you already may know. Um, my myths are encapsulated in these two books, which are the Informed Gardener books. And I have a, a book on um, more or less soup to nuts, garden design, all the way up to uh, troubleshooting um, with landscapes and gardens. And this is a compilation of chapters from, I believe, 22 authors, uh, most of them associated with, with the universities. And um, it's, it's a nice look at the science behind what, what are good practices. Um, how plants work is really plant physiology for, for gardeners and understanding what plants do, can and can't do. And, and like, like someone, someone had said, I think is one of their reviews is that you know, the, uh, the, the science is so much more entertaining and amazing than the, uh, than the, the myths that surround what plants do. And even though it's not, really germane to your area. I did want to mention this book here because a lot of people presume that um, because I have, I talk about native plants not being superior, that I don't like native plants. I actually do love native plants. And um, this book is for our region um, about gardening with native plants. And this is the type of book you should look for um, if, if you can find it. Um, the kind of the coffee table books that have, you know, every single native plant to, you know, your region are not particularly useful. 
Um, Art Krukeberg was a botany professor at University of Washington and, and he trialed hundreds of plants that he would find in different areas of the state and bring them home and plant them in his garden to see which ones would tolerate uh, cultivation. And so this is the collection of plants that will do well in garden conditions. And I think that that's the way that native plant um, books should be written is, is for, for whatever your area is, here's some plants that are pretty tough that will, will tolerate um, conditions that aren't um, ne necessarily native or natural. Um, this is a series that I did for the great courses on the science of gardening and it was a lot of fun. So if you, um, if you enjoy this type of presentation and want more and more hours of it, <laughs> you can find it there. I do have to tell you that I've got a um, new proposal out with great courses for doing a series on myth busting. Um, so that will hopefully be um, coming out in a few years. So uh, my, hu my husband will say that um, you're crazy if you want to listen to me yammer on for hours and hours, but some people like to listen to it. Um, ResearchGate is a website that's uh, free to get into, and you do have to create an account to use it, but it's not a paid account and they don't really want your, you know, they're not going to mine your information. They just want, you know, you to be a real person. And, but it's mainly been used by researchers who are just communicating with each other. And so we all kind of load up our papers there so that other researchers can find them and download them easily. So it's all free. And um, that, so each of us has our little library on there. And so you can find everything I've written in one place. So you don't have to go, you know, running around to different websites, um, you know, where the different journals are housed to find the articles. They're all in one place, which makes it really handy if you want a lot of um, articles at once. And I'd mentioned the NACA journal series before which is, it's kind of hard to put them into the research gate um, spot just because the way that they're, they're indexed. But the Journal of NAC is, you know, an online uh, resource. It's a peer reviewed resource. And we've written on, man you know, how you, how you plant and manage landscape trees. I mentioned the soil structure and functionality. We also have an article on soil nutrition and we have myth busting on pruning, woody plants, and we have one on using arborist wood chips at the landscape mulch. So those are all, as I said, peer reviewed by myself and my colleague who is a pathologist um, in extension in California. And this has been a great place for us to get good science out to uh, gardeners and, and landscape people. As Rebecca mentioned, we have a blog and the blog has been going on since 2009. And it's, it's pretty fun because uh, we take turns, um, everybody, Takes it takes a lap once a week, and so there's a you know a new post on some topic, and the nice thing is it's got that search box there, so you can look the archives on any topic, and find all the different posts that have occurred since 2009. We have um, vegetable specialists, we have me, um, we have a atmospheric science uh, atmospheric scientist who works in agriculture, so she you know she's concerned with how um, uh, weather conditions are affecting plants, which is really important right now. Um, we've got lots of other people that, that will write once in a while on various topics. So it's, it's a good place to just kind of sit and read and you can um, sign up for notifications when a new um, post drops so that you can always be right there when something new comes up. Um, we have a Facebook page, which is kind of a clearinghouse. It's not something that we have a this discussion. It's just you know, top down um, information on websites or blogs, sometimes just fun stuff. It's very popular. I have a, a volunteer administrator who runs it and I think we've got like 45,000 um, likes on it or something like that, which is really pretty darn good for something that's a science-based um, page. But I think that the thing that is most useful um, when you've got questions and you want a more kind of immediate dynamic experience is the Garden Professor's blog group which right now has got just over 27,000 people. You know, our, our mission is, is that we only discuss science-based information. We don't do anecdotes, we don't do home remedies, we don't do it yourselves. It's all science-based um, and relevant. And there's somebody on there all the time. We, I think I've got 12 volunteer administrators to help kind of herd the cats so that things don't go off the rails. Um, like we've been discussing just recently today about should you leave um, leaves on your lawn 
or, or, or what should you do with them? So there's been quite a bit of discussion on that. So it's always pertinent, it's often seasonal. And again, and this is something that's been around since 2011 and there's an archive there that you can go look from, at posts that are you know over 12 years worth of posts. Um, it's, a, it's a real um, wealth of information and I learn something different every day because I am not an expert in everything. So anyway, I hope that um, you've come up with some questions you might like to ask, and I'm happy to answer them. Linda, thank you so much for that. I'm just going to poll our in-person audience and see if anybody has any questions they'd like to ask. Okay. Yes. Go ahead, please. Oh, we're gonna get a gonna get a microphone. Thank you for a, a very interesting uh, presentation. I think a number of us were chuckling at some of your uh, observations about uh, these. Uh, strange uh, science articles that were popping up but um i'm, I'm actually curious, uh you were leaving us with a hint about uh, lasagna mulching and things like that and been pretty active in removing uh, invasive species in our green spaces and um actually dog strangling vine and really it's one of the it's quite a long process uh, getting rid of dog strangling vine and one of them is to to um, cover the, uh, the, the when it's really infested with five layers of cardboard. And we've been trying to ensure we're using the right science. Um, so I was, I know you didn't actually address that issue, but I was hoping you might give us a quick comment since I'm the first sure. person to ask a question. Absolutely. Um, and I will say before I get into it that you can find a lot of discussion about cardboard mulches and lasagna gardening um, in the Facebook group. And I've posted um, several blog posts as well about cardboard and lasagna gardening. So let me say, first of all, that a really great way of getting rid of um, invasives uh, or getting rid of your lawn or whatever you want to do is to uh, remove the resources, which is, you know, take, take everything down to the ground and then put about 12 inches of arborist wood chip mulch at the top. Um, arborist wood chips are a really good mulch in terms of allowing water and uh, gas transfer between the atmosphere and the soil. Um, we actually have research published um, comparing arborist wood chips to cardboard, to landscape fabric, to plastic in terms of how it affects oxygen movement into the soil. And a single sheet of cardboard is 10 times worse than four inches of arborist wood chips. So the problem is the more you put down, and the more difficulty there is for oxygen getting into the soil and everything in the soil needs oxygen. And that's, this has been an issue and I don't think, obviously many people haven't studied it. We wrote the first and so far the only paper on this topic, but we have to really think about what we do when we cover the soil. I've talked to gardeners before and I always say, well, why are you using cardboard? And they say, well, we want to smother the weeds. And my response is that smothering is a really bad verb to use when you're talking about a li living ecosystem, which is what the soil is. Weeds don't care. Weeds, um, <laughs> are going to be the most likely things to survive something like that. So I, I, I discourage the use of sheet mulches of any sort, whether it's cardboard or plastic or landscape fabric. Um, I found some rather disturbing information in an article just a few months ago about cardboard. And it was an article about um, using various kinds of bedding material for chickens because they were looking at uh, the presence of forever chemicals. And so I'm sure you're all familiar with the PFASs and the other uh, dioxin, all the things that get in the system and they're there forever. And it turns out that among bedding materials that shredded cardboard being one of them, that's the very worst one. It's full of, full of PFASs and other forever chemicals, much worse than all the other things they tested. So that's another thing to think about is that cardboard is not this nice, you know, benign, clean, material. Um, when you manufacture cardboard, there's a lot of chemicals put into it to make it uh, sturdy, to make it weather resistant, and um, those things have nasty chemicals in them. 
So I, after seeing that paper, especially, I mean, I would, I would never put cardboard, not even to my, my compost anymore. Um, we just recycle it. We, we, we won't have it on, on the ground at all. So um, I really, really encourage you to find a different way to deal with it. I will say that with things that are viney and things that spread underground, that you have to be able to isolate the area you're treating from um, other populations that you can't treat. Because if you can't keep them separate, you'll never get rid of the weed regardless of what you use because they're, it's going to continue to get resources from adjacent populations that aren't being you know, mulched or whatever, and you just can't get rid of it. So you have to put a root barrier or something down so that you can treat isolated areas and keep them weed free um, regardless of what it is you use. Another, for the benefit of our, on, our online audience, we have another question. Uh, hi, thank you so much for the presentation. We had a discussion just before you started to, uh, talking about tree planting. Mm -hmm. um, the government of Canada is planting many, many trees. Um, and my concern is, have you ever consulted governments on tree planting and how to do it to ensure that the soil actually allows them to grow properly? because I just read a book and by Suzanne Simard and she talked about the mother tree and how important it is that the mother tree is close to little trees and then all the fungus underneath. And I don't know, <laughs> my son went tree planting, did a thousand a day and I'm pretty sure it wasn't quality soil that was used. So I'm just wondering if, if horticulturalists consult with governments on how to do it so they actually grow. I would love if they would consult with horticulturists, but they don't. Um, the problem is there's too many steps removed. And so when you have tree planting activities go on, um, it tends to be done by portions of the government that, are, that aren't really associated with either plant or soil science. Um, you know, there's a lot of volunteer management. There's a lot of, you know, there, you know urban planning. There's all these things that are, that are important, but they really aren't germane to whether or not things are being planted correctly they're going to survive. And this has been a topic that's bothered me for decades. I'm thinking I need to write an op-ed for some paper where it'll actually get published because yeah, you're right. You know, you have all these tree planting activities that go on and um, a lot of people don't plant things correctly. Um, the soil isn't, isn't treated properly. Um, there's no aftercare. There's just, I mean, I can tick off, you know, 20 different things that happen, which means that if anything survives, it's a miracle because everything is, is stacked against it. So it's, it's a huge waste of resources. It's a huge waste of, of volunteer time. It also discourages a lot of people because they go back to see what they're planted and you know, most of it's dead. So this is, it's a disconnect that's been there forever. And I think it's because people in government just don't understand that there's a science behind managing plants, just like there's a science behind veterinary medicine and there's science behind human medicine. You know, people with PhDs in plant sciences are plant doctors. And we certainly know more about that than someone who doesn't have that type of background. So there's a, there's a lot of issues with it and how you get past that divide and actually get uh, governments to consult with, with people that know what they're doing, I, I honestly don't know. Any more questions in the hall? And I'm going to check online. Linda, I really, really want to thank you for the talk tonight. Um, we actually had Doug Tallamy present to us during COVID. And um, I know he was his talk was very inspiring for a lot of us. Um, and we have a very strong emphasis on native plants in within the community of, of people who belong to our, our gardening club. So it was a little bit shocking to hear that um, some of his research may not be right on right on the money. Uh, but regardless, it's it's great information to know and so important, I think, for all of us to have a good I understanding of, of uh, what was it you called it, the CRAF analysis? Um, yes, CRAF analysis, yep. Another acronym. <laughs> Can't forget that one.
thank you so much indeed for, for this presentation tonight. It's been eye-opening and I think something that a lot of us will, uh, will have some really important lessons to take away with. Um, so it's just, it's been really wonderful. I, I, for the benefit of, of those uh, here in the hall and online, um, I do have, I actually have an autographed copy of your book about how plants work. And I highly recommend that as something that uh, is, is really worth looking at. And I do follow your research on ResearchGate. Um, always find it useful and, and helpful. And as I said at the outset, I think you're one of the very few people working in plant science today at a level that is actually useful to gardeners. So great appreciation for your work. Thank you again so much for being with us this evening. And Oh, uh, absolutely. And I really appreciate, you know, I, and I know it, it can be really uncomfortable to, to, to hear information that doesn't seem to fit, you know, that doesn't fit with, um, you know, what, what you've learned before. And, and so let me say that almost everything that I, that I talk about now in terms of how to manage uh, plants and soils, I did it all wrong when I was getting, even when I was getting my PhD in horticulture because the science just wasn't there. And all you had was the folklore and the, and, you know, the, 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 the perceptions. Um, the nice thing is that now, um, let's see how many years is it now? Uh, <laughs> 30, 40 years later, um, there's a lot more science than when I was getting my degree. And it's, it's, it's fun for me. My, my perceptions of what's going on change all the time. So I think that's what's great about it is that, you know, it's dynamic, it's changing, it's evolving. We're understanding so much more now about how soils and plants function than we used to. Sorry, I had myself muted. I was just saying I agree. And I think one of the things that keeps us hooked as gardeners is that continuous learning. Thank you again. Absolutely. You bet. I'm going to say good night now to uh, our online audience. I'll just do one last quick check and make sure we. Uh... Oh, yeah, questions. Um... You've got some folks online who are interested in buying your books. So <laughs> oh. <laughs> we'll, we'll share the information about how they can do that. Well, most of them, yeah, most of our on Amazon. That's probably the easiest way to do it. <laughs> Thank you again and best wishes for the season to, uh, to come. Thank you. You too. Have fun. Good night.